Welcome back. This is John. We're walking through Psych Social Passage number two on the new AMC free practice exam. It's a short one, which is awesome, but we're still going to jump right into it because we're going to get to learn about some topics that we don't hear about as much like Freudian ID, super ego, and stuff like that. So let's take a look at the passage. Jumping into this passage, we're going to flow chart out everything, you know, highlight the basic sciences, write out the relationships, and then we're going to take these questions one at a time. So it says a patient who experiences a low self-esteem. So right out of the gate, we have a term that we learned in our MCAT prep, and that is self-esteem. the idea of how you view yourself. Seeks the help of a therapist. The therapist finds that the patient's self-esteem problems start after his current relationship began. The patient describes his current partner as being highly successful and competent and reports feeling inferior to his partner. He reports that he, quote, hates feeling that way. He has stopped attending social events with his partner because such events elevate his feeling. This is getting sad. Such events elevate his feelings of inferiority. However, despite his feelings of inferiority and envy, the patient also reports having extreme admiration and love for his partner. This is very sad. All right, so now that the MCAT's got the vibes low, when researching for the case, the therapist reads a study on interpersonal attraction. The researchers ask participants to rate their actual self and their ideal self. So these are psych terms, right? Actual self, which is the idea of who you actually are. And ideal self is who you see yourself as being, who you'd like yourself to be. On 50 personality dimensions, these ratings were then used to develop two scores as proxy measures of actual and ideal self. Then the participants were told that they were going to be paired with potential dates. Ooh, we're playing matchmaker. And were given information on their potential date scores on the same personality dimensions. After that, the AAMC made a new Netflix special titled... I'm just kidding. Um, oh! New Netflix special titled Chemistry. Um, all right. So the, the date scores were made up by the researchers to be either similar to or different from each participant's actual self or ideal scores. The study showed that participants reported greater interest in dates who were similar to their ideal selves than in dates who were similar to their actual selves. The therapist finds that the study relevant to the patient's case but is reluctant to make direct inferences because she suspects that the participants' ratings of actual self may have been influenced by social desirability. So social desirability is another term, but also there is a relationship in here. And that relationship is the idea that you tend to prefer someone that's closer to your ideal self more than your actual self. Kind of makes sense. You know, you're, you're attracted to somebody that is doing the things and being the person that you would like to be and the things that you would like to perceive yourself as enjoying. So that kind of makes sense. The therapist decides that the self-evaluation maintenance model, which we're going to call SIM, apparently, may help explain the patient's case. So if they, if they introduce like a model or something like that, you're probably gonna, they're probably going to tell you what it is, and then you're going to have to have that in your flowchart. So I'm going to write it down. The model posits that upward comparison, comparing yourself to a more successful other, like Ryan Reynolds, perhaps, can lead to negative self-evaluation, which causes psychological distress. It happens when I think about Ryan Reynolds. So what we're going to say that this sim model is we're going to have an upper comparison. So an, oop, that made no sense. Upper comp, which is going to lead to a negative eval and distress. The individual is motivated to eliminate the distress, either by downplaying the relevance of the dimension of comparison. For example, if the patient's partner is a successful mathematician, then the patient can say that math is stupid, or by weakening the social bonds with the successful other. So whenever you feel this distress, this, this model posits that you have two options. You can either kind of state the opposite pretty hardcore, or you can run. So you can run away from that person, kind of distance yourself, kind of distance yourself, or you can downplay. So downplay how important their unique skill is. So if we're going back to the Ryan Reynolds analogy, then I would say something like, it's not even that important for your hair to look good all the time. Or I would stop watching his movies, which I can't. I can't stop. So... That, is what, that would be your response to that negative distress. So let's look at these questions and uh, see how many more Ryan Reynolds jokes I can make 
in a five minute period. Uh, number first says, which statement is not a plausible application of psychodynamic theory to explain psychological responses to upward comparison? What the heck did that just say? Okay, let's, let's kind of pump brakes, reread it, because um, I genuinely don't know what this says. Which of these is not a plausible application of the psychodynamic theory to explain psychological responses to upward comparisons? Okay, so psychodynamic theory. First, you got to say, what is that? Um, if you know it, and right off the top of your head, you know exactly what you're talking about. It's like the one thing that you learned about Freud saying that you weren't immediately like, that guy's a perv. So the psychodynamic theory is this idea that if you focus, that, that primarily focusing on like um, the, the unconscious will lead you to explanations about a person's behavioral or, or maybe in their emotional content as well-being. But most of you probably didn't know that, and that's completely okay. So how, if you didn't know that, would you know what the heck you're talking about? Well, let's keep reading. So, which statement is not a plausible application of psychodynamic theory to explain psychological responses to upward comparison? So, we know that we're looking at the responses to upward comparison. So, what I'm going to say is that we're here, right? So, we're looking for the responses, which are these things. This, this negative feeling, this distress, may, maybe even the downplay of the distance. So, what this question is saying then is... Which of these answer choices is, go is not going to be relevant or could not be a possible explanation for what's going on here? So we're going to get into some super ego, some ego, some ID, and I'm really not going to take the time to explain all of them because I'm not going to do as good of a job as, as Google. And I'm really not the best one to do it. I'm really not super... Um, I, don't, I don't have a deep understanding of those. All I know is that the super ego kind of creates the demands. The ego kind of allows you to fill the void. It helps you do whatever is necessary to fill the void. And the it is kind of like that most primal, instinctive part of your personality. Now, if you go and Google those terms, I guarantee you that it'll use a lot of the words that I used because whenever I was studying for the MCAT, I literally like Googled it and I just put those definitions in there. But that's the extent of my understanding of these topics because they're pretty low yield for the MCAT and you don't have to know them for medical school. I'm going to show you how to still get the answer correct whenever you have a very baseline understanding of something. So A says the superego demands that the individual should either match or surpass the partner on the dimension of comparison. So here's what I'm going to do. I don't super understand what superego means. So I'm not even going to pay attention to it. Is that the best option? No. But that's where we are. We're taking the test right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to completely ignore it. I'm not going to focus on that part. So it demands that the individual should either match or surpass the partner on the dimension of comparison. So there's definitely something that is doing that, right? And that's what I'm curious about. Is there, is there a parallel to something that is saying, hey, you should... That should be you. And yes, so this patient, this patient that we're talking about, um, he's feeling inferiority, envious to his partner, but he's admiring them. He's thinking, man, I should be able to do that. Like, it's, it's pretty cool that um, she or he, it doesn't really specify for this partner, can do that. And they're comparing themselves to them. And the fact that they're not doing it then leads to the distress. So... There's this comparison, and there's something inside of you that's saying, man, I should like, I, that should be me, or if I was given the opportunity, I would do that even better. And so um, I do think that that's a plausible op application. So I'll say maybe not to A. B says the ego fails to satisfy the demands of the superego, and the individual experiences anxiety. Something is not satisfying something, and that's leading to anxiety. So is there a correlate to that here? Well, we have this void created by this upper comparison, and we fail to feel it, and we get this distress or this anxiety. So yeah, there's a parallel to that. So I'll say maybe not to be. C says the idea attempts to use the pleasure principle to resolve the subconscious conflict caused by the superego. Okay, so if we ignore the ID, and again, if you even even having like the basic understandings of what superego and ego and ID means would really help you get this answer correct. I'm kind of like I talked about superego is kind of creating the demands and it's, it's creating the subconscious demands that the is the ego's job to fill, and the ID is like the more primitive primal 
portion of this. So let's try eliminating this and answering it with the words that we do understand. It says that we use the pleasure principle to resolve the subconscious conflict caused by the superego. Is there a correlate to using something that seems like it would be titled the pleasure principle here? Not really. I mean, you can say that downplaying somebody or creating distance, maybe that would create pleasure, but I really think that would just minimize negative feeling rather than creating ple pleasure. So um, I don't really like C for that answer choice. And also, if you kind of remember the basics that I talked about, you know, superego creates, ego fills. This is created by the superego, and this answer choice is trying to say it's filled by the, by the id. So I don't really like that. Um, so that's probably going to be our answer because we're looking for the not correct one. D says the ego uses rationalization by suggesting that the dimension of comparison is unimportant. Well, that's kind of what downplaying is, right? It's not important to, for your hair to look as great as Ryan Reynolds. So maybe not D. The correct answer here is C. And I'm going to do something that I usually don't do because I think they're really bad. That's kind of like one of the main reasons we have this channel. But for this one, since I didn't super, I'm not super great at the sciences, um, the correct, I'm going to read the AAMC's answer explanation for this one. So it says, while the id does operate according to the pleasure principle, according to the psychodynamic theory, it is the responsibility of the ego and not the id to resolve subconscious conflict caused by the superego. Thus, this statement is not a plausible application of psychodynamic theory to explain psychological responses to upward comparison. So that was nice and succinct and helpful like the AMC always is. But that is their explanation of it. This next one, I do know the words. It says, the patient described in the passage is most likely using witch defense mechanisms. So we are talking about our patient that is intimidated by his partner in their positioning and is responding or how are they coping with this so a says projection projection i would imagine to see our patient like lashing out and trying to find somebody else to make feel inferior you know like maybe they're talking down to like a um like a service worker like a restaurant uh, like a waitress or something like that but we don't see that so maybe not a b says rationalization rationalization um, would be trying to make this a rational decision. So what would be the logical explanation for me not realizing my actual self? So maybe if this patient was saying something like, um, oh, well, my partner's family is rich, and so that is why he became a doctor and I wasn't able to do that, or, or, or she became a doctor and I wasn't able to do that. I'm really not sure. They didn't specify the partner's gender in this. But that's not what we see. We pretty much see like this idea of feeling really envious but what's actually vented is admiration and love. Like, I hate how much I love you. <laughs> um, or maybe I love how much I hate you. Something twisted. But so we don't see rationalization there. And then we see reaction formation, which is the idea of you, a defense mechanism that is vented by expressing or showing an emotion that's the complete opposite to the way that you feel. It's kind of like whenever you go home for winter break and your family's like, hey, you know, how is school going? Do you like your classes? And inside, you're like, I hate studying. Like, holy crap, I chose the wrong career. I hate studying. I'm going to be 95 by the time I graduate. And that's what you're thinking inside. But outside, you say, oh, yeah, you know, it's going good. I got good grades. And, you know, I'm very, very thankful and fortunate to be in this position. And um, I like pie. So can we, can we, can we talk, stop talking about me? How are your kids? You know? So that's kind of what reaction formation is. You, you vent the opposite emotion to what you're actually feeling. So that's kind of what's going on here. Um, he feels envious and he expresses admiration and love. So I like C and D says emotional displacement. Emotional displacement um, is it, the, it's the idea of displacing or moving your emotions from one target to another. Uh, so it's it's not projection, though, because from my understanding of emotional displacement, I encourage you to go look this one up. My understanding of emotional displacement is that it, it's it's more about moving a, a positive or, or, or the emotion to like a more deserving individual. So 
Um, it's kind of interesting, but that's not what we're getting here. We're getting this complete reversal of the um, emotion. So the correct answer here is C. But I do want to give an honor honorable mention to this one. I think it's very, very tempting to answer with answer choice B because of this SIM model here. So if you picked rationalization, it's probably because you thought, oh, well, downplaying, downplaying the importance of something is rationalizing why I didn't achieve my potential. And I would agree. But my explanation for why you would go with reaction formation is, is that this scenario was a made-up scenario. So you, not, you should not be answering this question based off of this scenario. You should be answering the question off of the defense mechanism that the patient actually reported. And the actual reported mechanism is in the first paragraph. So it's really tricky, but make sure that whenever they introduce, like, because MCAT does this, they, like, give you the background, and then they'll introduce maybe new sciences, maybe these experiences. Make sure that you're answering questions based off of what your specific question is testing you on. Because um, that is a really tricky one right there. So number nine says, was the independent variable in the study manipulated by the researchers? So remember the study was Love Island 2.0? No, chemistry. Um, I've come up with a new Netflix show. Have, ha I'll have my people reach out to them. So was the independent variable in chemistry able to be manipulated? So A says, yes, the researchers obtained specific measures of the actual self and the ideal self from the participants. So remember, in this matchmaker, this uh, study where they kind of played matchmaker, what they did is they, they measured our participants' ideal self, and then what they changed was the ideal self of the person that they were introducing. So that is not of the participant, right? That's, that's, that's the, um, the date. So maybe not to A. B says, yes, the researchers controlled the similarity of the potential date to the participants rating of themselves, right? So that was the independent variable is who you got matched with. And that's, that's what they altered. So that's going to be the correct answer. Um, C and D are both no, but they definitely altered it, right? Like, and so the one that the researcher changed is the potential dates scores on this uh, personality exam or this actual self exam. Um, and then number 10 says, which statement best explains the patient's behavior in terms of operant conditioning. So if you've heard me talk about operant conditioning, or maybe you've read our high yield book and you see that operant conditioning is one of the few psych social topics in the actual book, like they're sneaking it in everywhere. I mean, though, there, there are definitely whole passages on operant conditioning, but this passage had no business of having operant conditioning in it, but they threw it in there because that's a high yield topic. They really want you to understand this. Um, so remember, operant conditioning is the idea of increasing or decreasing behaviors but based off of giving rewards, punishments, or removing those stimuli. So um, A says, feelings of inferiority act as positive reinforcers for attending social events. Or positive means you add it, right? And reinforcer means you increase the behavior. Um, well, you did add it, right? Because you added like the stress and the inferiority that comes from the from the social event. But does your behavior get reinforced? Does your individual end up going back to more par parties? Like, I hate the way I feel here, so I'm gonna go to more. I'm a little masochist. So maybe not to A, because no, you go to less parties. B says feelings of inferiority function as a negative reinforcer for attending social events. So if you're, if you're not super familiar with the lingo that is used in opera conditioning, you might pick this one because it, it feels like you would want something that would say negative because you think negative means bad. That's not what it means in this context. Negative just means the removal of the stimulus. Like grounding a kid, you remove their phone. That would be a negative, um, negative punisher probably in that, in that sense. Because you remove the stimulus, and so we're not removing any stimulus when, we, when we're taking them to a party. So already you can rule out B. You can also rule out D for that reason. And you get to C, which says feelings of inferiority function as a positive punisher for attending social events with a partner. So is it positive? Are you adding a stimulus? Yep. Is it a punisher? Meaning does it decrease their behavior? Does it make them want to come to less parties? Yep. So correct answer here is answer choice C. That's it. Thanks for hanging through. Thanks for listening to all my jokes. 
Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and check out the links in the description for more help and study with us, and I will see you in the next one.